All right, man. Uh, we're back. 2021. We're back, man. How you feeling? Feeling good, man. Uh, you know, my birthday passed. Uh, got Happy a, belated. Appreciate it. Got a, got a, uh, a great birthday present. Uh, caught the vid. As, oh, as no. Kevin Hart likes to say. Are you good? You good? Yeah, man. I'm, I'm at the tail end of my, my quarantine period. Um, it was my own like day nine at this point. Um, I didn't have any too severe symptoms. Like I lost my, my taste and smell for a couple days, but, um, that was probably like the, the biggest part of it. My nose is a little stuffy, but you know, that's about it. I had like a, a, a pretty bad cough though, um, for a few days. I'm kind of just getting over that part. Yeah. But other than that, man, I'm, I'm all right. So you like you, we made it through an economic decline. We saw the uh, riots. We saw a takeover in D.C. And you survived a deadly disease, which is, to me, look, bro, 50 Black Cent out. ain't got shit on you, bro. <laughs> you, you got a story to tell. <laughs> you got a story to tell. That's crazy. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad to see you doing good, man. Um, I, I just got married digitally. This is why this background is here. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so um, got Zoom married cause, because the Baltimore County courts are closed. And, I mean, they're open, but they're not allowing yeah, letters. Yeah, yeah, right. So I went through, like, a weird situation, man. Like, I was supposed to get married this time uh, this year. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was, uh, you know, we had a wedding set that was outside. And, and we changed our minds, basically. We didn't want to endanger anybody. So we canceled, man. And um, sure. we decided to invest that money in a house. So um, Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, in February, end of February, we, we were moving into a house in, uh, in Arundel County, which is, like, um, fairly close to here it's kind of in between dc and in baltimore and that's kind of why we decided to move there and uh for where it's located we get a little more land as well Uh, that's a weird thing to think about man like land and yeah shit like that so it feels strange it feels strange to be honest that's good though man i'm I'm proud of you you're making progress in life thanks man thanks thanks uh i don't think i could have done it without um, you know, good friends around, good friends and family, and you know, yeah, you know, you, you we talk, we talk fifty times a day, me and you, and uh, you know, you were you were seeing what I was going through, man. I had, you know, the day I had to cancel my wedding, I didn't feel good, man. I, I just, you know, this is one of those things that I wanted my mom to see. My dad's not here. I yeah. wanted my mom to be there, and you know, I, it was like a big thing for me, so. So my mom stunned on me. She uh, she's like, <laughs> <laughs> she's like in, she's like in the office and doesn't uh-huh. say where she's at. She's yeah. like, hey, what's up, hey? And and her her feet, so she's about to get married. My mom's about to get married, so she's engaged, and she's like talking to her uh, fiance, and then she calls me after the wedding. She's like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry that we couldn't be there because of COVID, but I'm about to go to the inauguration across the street. <laughs> she just like. <laughs> Got out of her tears real quick. It's like, I'm going to go see uh, Barack Obama. She has a picture with, um, oh, yo, Cory Booker. Uh Cory Booker comes up to her and is like, hey, hey, are you Sylvia? And and gives her a hug. And she's like, your your fiance came to me for advice on how to propose to you. So it was like a big deal. And I'm like, and then, and then as she's talking, to him, Rosario Dawson comes over. So, it, it, my mom stunned it on me. Like I, I, I was going to say, that's not the first time that she's done that either. That's the I had a part. wedding. I had a wedding, and then she <laughs> hits me with, I, I, I hugged one of your crushes from, you know, right. your entire life. And uh, so, it's crazy. It's real crazy. But I'm happy, man. I'm happy for my mom. I'm happy that um, all my friends are healthy, man. Like, everybody's good right now you know i That's fortunately good, you know everybody seems to be okay yeah. uh, including the elderly you know none of my uh elders have um you know fall prey to everything going on with covid because yeah. you can catch it even if, you, if you're not trying to you know what i mean it's not like yeah, one of those things where like you know yeah you can do everything that you you're supposed to and still catch it That's yeah, the crazy part. yeah yeah so um i'm really i'm really happy to see that you're doing better man i'm, I'm happy it, to be man. talking to you um yeah so how's how's creativity? How's that round been going? Man, so uh, 
obviously this is the first time we've recorded in a while so yeah the the world's definitely went on on pause since then i've obviously been trying to get some conversations back going and trying to put some things in place for for 2021 but a lot of production has been been paused in in all industries so uh, yeah. i'm in the design field so that's kind of paused a lot of the stuff that i was trying to get done and make some some moves but um trying to get the the 2021 20, conversations going um i haven't done much designing i've updated my portfolio a little bit um i think the last time well before the last time we recorded no after the last time we recorded i did my uh first uh solo artist talk with uh baltimore's motor house how'd that go man it was amazing, man. Um, we did it uh, digitally uh, due to COVID because you know of all the restrictions and what the what the venue was. Um, so it was like a one on one conversation. They had like a camera crew, so we did basically like two parts. Me kind of going over some pieces that I designed in some some moments in my career, and then we kind of did like a a Q and A afterwards and got some questions from the audience via Instagram. So that was a a unique experience, man. That's really dope, man. Congratulations. Congratulations. And the cool part is, you know, it's it's out there. You did it. You know, that's that's the beginning. That's one of many, you know? Yeah. And it's that's, actually up on YouTube if anybody wants to check it out. Uh just search my name, Dante Kai, and it'll come up. Motor House Artist Talk. And we'll put it in the we'll put it in the links. We'll put it down in the links on the YouTube. Um, so that people can just, you know, access it and uh share it, you know, because that yeah. I thought it was a great interview, man. Um, that space in general is really good. Motorhouse is is really trying to foster a good environment for creators. So for I'm sure. always down, man. Especially Baltimore. I'm like, it, it's such a crazy, jam-packed talent town. Like, it's a lot of really amazing artists that, that need exposure. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that happened. Um, what's been going on with me? Man, so um, before COVID hit, I, I kind of went out on a limb and and try to create something for uh a sneaker shop and you know you you were there you were there along the way there's a shop nine under ten condition um you know most of my most of the business that i've done is is brick and mortar so you know right. people it's, it's kind of a hard thing man like internet works for me in some respects mm -hmm. and, and i'll talk about that in a little bit but when it comes to status apparatus, people got to touch it. I don't know what it is. Yeah. It does okay online, but when people touch it and look at it, that's when people buy it. So I went to the shop and, and talked to the owner, Birdo, and I was just like, yo, I think I can make a good shop hoodie for you. Like, I, it could work. It could, it could be cool. And um, so the way, the way that my production goes, you know, my, my, my plug is he, it, it's all or none. It's not, okay. it's, uh, they would do a sample, but the sample is like the cost of six of them. So sometimes you just gotta like trust just, the process. Yeah. And, and you know, especially if the timeline is shorter, if the timeline is longer, you could do that. You could do a sample and then, you know, six months later do this. And if, 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 if it's like a year production down, mm -hmm. I could do that. But if, but if I'm trying to do something in six months, <laughs> it's all or nothing. And I had to basically bank on this idea that, the design was good enough that he would want to put it in the shop. And, you know, I, I had some designs and I ran some ideas by you and I appreciate you for helping yeah, me for with sure, that, man. man. Cause it was, it was crazy. Like, uh, you know, I had the, the bulk of the idea, but there was like little parts that you, you finished off that just made the, the, the touches so much better that they really completed the hoodie design. So I showed him the mock-up and mm -hmm. he was like, cool. You know, when you, when you get them, yeah. Let me know. COVID hit, and oh. then his his store shut down. All the stores shut down. Baltimore shut down. Yes. And I, you know, I was, I was, it was in the back of my mind. The box was set up over here. <laughs> it was dusty, and you know, we're like three months into the pandemic, and I, yeah. I decided something, man. My gas and electric was going up like crazy, like like everybody else's internet yeah, usage right. going up crazy. Yeah. So I decided to make like a pop art based t-shirt company mm -hmm. like just something uh, what, what i like to call fast food like we have this discussion about fast food you know like fast food versus you know good meals in terms yeah. of design but what i'm starting to realize is like i'm not above it you know i don't think anybody's above creating things that are a little less deep a little less uh grounded in like you know like status apparatus is kind of 
more material, more cost, more, you know, yeah. that fit is different. These are just t-shirts with designs on it. So I decided to put it out and I wound up doing like uh, a couple hundred sales during COVID. Right. Which, which gave me this nest egg to invest in, uh, you know, uh, put, put a down payment on the house towards it. It didn't pay off the down payment, obviously, yeah. but money towards it. Right. For sure. You know, I made some stock moves during COVID, which, which wound up doing well. And that, <laughs> so like, it's just, all this stuff is becoming kind of like a realization that you can't just rely on just a job. Yeah. I get a call. Yo, you still got them hoodies. You was trying to, you just trying to sell. Like I, you know, I need to look at them again. Let me see. Let me see what they look like. Right. I gave him one. He's like, yo, these are fire. Bring them. We go sell them. Sell, I'm going to sell all 50 of them. Well, I, so I kept some to the side because I needed some for friends and shit. Yeah. But we, we put them in the uh, store and they sold out in, uh, in about a week and a half. About a week and a half, all 50. And it was in, like, to, to say that I was proud is an understatement. I still owe you one. I set one aside for you, bro. Oh man, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I set uh, one of- they they uh they kind of split the stock. They did some in store and then some online. And then yeah. when I went to go buy my size online, it had already sold out, but all the other sizes were available. So I was like, ah, I got that's never happened before, by the way. That's never been the thing where people hit me up and I'd be like, <laughs> I don't have any in your size. I'd be like, I have 20 in your size. Do you want to? So it, it it was a real cool thing, man. Like and, and what happened was because the primary focus of the hoodie was not out of 10 condition, which is the name of the, the right. shop. People didn't know they were walking around with my shit. So like people were taking pictures like, yo, this hoodie is crazy that they sell it out nine out of 10. Yeah. I'm just like, this feels good, man. I forgot how that felt. You know, we've, yes. we've both of us have experienced that where we've sold something um, and, and just had that feeling where you, where you see somebody with it on or, somebody compliments you, you get a DM or email or, you know, somebody yeah, comes yeah. up to you. It's nothing like it, man. And so, you know, I, I, I know that COVID was very hard for people. And I know that it was, it was very difficult to kind of find your footing because just, you know, people's whole life was taken from under them. You know, a lot of people lost their jobs. For sure. So, um, you know, to, to be working, and able to put things out, you know, two streams of income that I just didn't expect to happen. I'm, I'm so thankful, man. I'm so thankful you helped me with the hoodie, you know, kind of round this whole look up for the hoodie. For sure. And, and, and you got some credits, man. Like you can always put that on your portfolio. You, 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 I, I don't know what that's called. Like you, you, you line managed it. You are, you are a lot, you, you got line manager background, man. Like you got a, you got a thing, you know, about spacing and, you know, spacing on stuff and materials. That's just something, yeah. that's a gift, man. Appreciate Run with that, that. Run with that. You're a super yeah. talented dude. You know, though, that's part of the, the conversations that I, that I have with, with, uh, brands. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's, it's, it's not the right time for me to mention who, what, where, when, but yeah. those are the type of conversations that I have and, you know, nothing's landed yet where it needed to, but I feel like it's coming soon. And like I said, I, I lost last year, the majority of last year, because I had an opportunity coming up right before, literally like the week before the world okay. shut down. But um, hopefully 2021, I can get some things going. But, you know, we're not sure how close we are to the, the end of all this. But, you know, we'll try and get some things done. Man, that was a, that was a dude. You may have heard of him. His name was David Robinson. He played, he played, he was in the military. They brought him to the NBA. Yeah. He ain't come in the regular way. He got championships. <laughs> what I'm saying is you could do that, man. You could do that. It's just possible. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, I think it's real easy for people to, because they've heard stories, to kind of talk to you in this, like, you got to do A and right. B and C. But, you know, you're shooting, you're, you're practicing, yeah. you're doing squats, you're doing, you know, scrimmages. Yeah. So that when you get put in the game, that's it. Yeah, you know that thing. Like I'm, I'm putting up numbers with what I do. So yeah. like I'm, I'm not mad at that. And, and the other thing is like the way that I'm doing it, I'm kind of breaking the mold and the tradition of how it's supposed to be done. Yeah. So I understand that that's going to be you know challenging and difficult, and, and you know it's not the path of everybody. But I, yeah. I want to do that. 
Yeah, that's dope, man. Oh, oh, let me show this uh, one of these designs I did. So this is um, Radio Raheem. You rest in peace. Oh, man. <laughs> that's a T-Jam design that I did. Yo, it's people... first time I've actually like visually seen it in, For real? in, in 3D. I haven't really worn this out, man, but like I, you know, pop pop culture references yeah. is just a thing for me. And like old movies, like do the right thing. I'm gonna probably get this on a hoodie too. And uh, I just love hoodies. Hoodies just fit different. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I try to put out a couple of designs um, a week. And I'm doing a collaboration with um, the IG model Kiss by Ken. She's supposed to be posting my stuff in early February. Okay. And hopefully that'll bring some traffic to uh, T Jam. That would be this dope. The, yeah, she she has a million followers. Kindest person, by the way. <laughs> Kindest fun, person. But okay. You think you think that she'd be <laughs> you, know, you, you just expect if if I'm not gonna lie to you, um, if I had 1.2 million followers, I would act like I was somebody's uh like press agent. Mm-hmm. Like I would act like I was, I would, I would not act like I was me. I'd be like, on behalf of Ron James, uh, if you could leave a message in the DMs, <laughs> he'll get back to you as soon as possible. Like right. I wouldn't even, I yeah. would just lie. And then, and then, and they're like, oh, okay, hey, how you doing? This is Ronald. Come in a couple of messages later, because because that's what you do if you have that many followers. There's there's no way that you can't act regular if you have that many people. But she, the kindest person, so. Word. We'll, we'll see That's what happens. Good, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm always glad to hear people are, are still nice. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is a nice thing, man. It's a nice, it's nice to be nice. It pays off. It does. It pays off. Um, what you been watching, man? Um, a lot. You know, I run my movie club, uh, DCO movie club. So uh this week was kind of jam-packed because a lot of stuff came out in January. Yo. Uh so <laughs> yo. One night in Miami. I uh, watched that. Uh also watched uh American Skin. That was last night. How was that? What'd you think? I haven't um, seen it yet. It is a very relevant story. Mm-hmm. Um it's definitely a trigger warning story. Mm. Um it falls in that same vein of like Queen and Slim type movie. Okay. Um but it's a very good conversation and the way that they do the dialogue in particular scenes um is very good for conversation okay um, so you can like extract what they were talking about from the movie and have real life conversations about it and you know i appreciate that cool cool damn man i i you know i watched the interview with him uh recently i know that you know nathan's um our reputation is a little scattered, yeah. you know, because of everything that kind of went down a couple of years ago. For sure. But uh, he has a voice, man, that I really, I really, I, you know, I like, to be honest. Yes. Um, and I'm, you know, it's, I do want to check it out. I do want to, yeah. um, you know, I, I run Movie Show Movie. I have a podcast with two other guys. And, um, you know, I haven't seen it yet, but I do want to talk about it. Also, um, HBO is sending us, um, Judas and the Messiah pretty um, soon, so we can talk. I cannot wait. Cannot wait. Oh, um, for the people that are very interested in Judas and the Messiah, there's actually this um, documentary that you should check out. If you don't know much about the Black Panthers, it's called Black, the Black Panthers Vanguard of the Revolution. Um, it's a pretty, pretty cohesive sort of collection of information about the Black Panthers and everything that went down, including some of the events covered in Judas and the Messiah. So, oh, yeah, yes. Uh, also related to that, another good movie, uh, Trial of the Chicago 7. Oh, and what'd you I think got, of that? I loved it. Um, I went to, for the movie club Instagram, go back and pull some quotes that I thought were very important in the movie mm-hmm. and kind of post them because I haven't seen much from that movie. Um, also related to the story of the Black Panthers. That's why I, I brought it up. You'll see why when you watch the movie. I don't want to give away the, mm. the plot points in that. And uh, documentary, documentary related to One Night in Miami, uh, The Two Killings of Sam Cooke. Mm. So in that documentary, it's on Netflix. Um, they pretty much talk about uh, Sam Cooke in that vein of him trying to speak to his people and 
you know, be an advocate and an activist through his music. And they talk about that, uh, that night in Miami, uh, in real life, Jim Brown is actually in the documentary. So definitely worth a watch if you want more context to that, to that movie. Um, I think Regina King did a, an amazing job on it. It was very, very beautiful. I loved it. Damn, man. I got to check that out. I got to check that out. Um, Netflix has been king of, of documentaries lately, man. Like they've been putting out fire. You know, I don't, I don't love every single thing that they do, but man, they're documentaries. Yes. <laughs> Especially like historical ones, like some of the ones about, you know, black figures that we just haven't seen. Yeah. Um, just really good, man. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'll check that out. Uh, didn't they like do a second version? Didn't they do like one version and then they like re-released it? I feel like I saw. A yeah, second. they remastered a lot of the the uh, movies that they've done. I didn't watch it originally. Mm. Um, and what they'll do is they'll update it. They like the original version won't be there, so I'm not sure what they actually remastered it in it. Um, but I think there's one on Bob Marley that they remastered. I feel like the Nina Simone one um, as well. Um, but there's like a, a a genre of like musical documentaries that they have. Gotcha. Um, there's a documentary about Billie Holiday that just came out called Billie. That's mm-hmm. definitely worth checking out. Um, if you know, I have, I had to break it up, man. It's it's, it's like a lot of heavy yeah. shit in it. Sometimes I got to yeah. break it up a little bit. But um, I started on it. It's really good. That this is not one that's on streaming services right now. So you got probably rent it on. You can rent it on uh, iTunes or Amazon Prime or Vudu or Vimeo. Uh, like you can, you can find them pretty much any, uh, anywhere that things are streaming and can be purchased, uh, Billy. So it's, it, it's, it's like a good time for things to come out. Cause you got a captive audience. Yeah. You know, it's like people are, they have no place to go besides, you know, if, if you have to go to work, you got to go to work, but people are home most of the time. Yeah. Like home, 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 watching stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, I was really thinking about the context of our podcast to the world. Mm. And I think we kind of are very poignant in who we bring on as guests, uh, the selection process, um, because this is something that we kind of hold dear to our heart and take very seriously. And oh, yeah feel like it's it's a very important context in the world we would love to do more episodes but it's it's also something that we kind of hold quality over quantity on yeah which i i really appreciate and then i was thinking about it if you go back and listen to our episodes even the one that we're doing right now you'll be able to find a thread that connects each guest to another one which is really crazy when you think about it yeah yeah and you know there was like this talk especially when we first started I was like, man, I love what we're doing. Uh, we had Kalila, who uh, did Mess in the Bottle. Um, and we had a um, couple other people. And I was like, man, we, we, need, more, we need more women. We need more yeah. women. Yeah. And we found one that I think is going to blow your minds, especially if you're into uh, just content in general right now. <laughs> Blackness. Blackness. It's just so cool. So I'm, I'm really excited. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you hear from our guests that we have. Yeah. Are we gonna say what we're gonna say? Um yeah, I I, I guess I wanna say how I think it's connected. So Yeah, please do. Uh I guess the, the starting point would be for me, I guess two years ago at this point. Yeah, it was two years ago. Um African American Footwear Forum, first one was in DC, mm-hmm. uh Black History Month. Um so there, there was a panel of people. Uh, Ernie, who was a previous guest, was was up there. Um, that was like my, my first introduction to him. And then I just kept running into him around Baltimore. And <laughs> we ended up just becoming cool. And Because uh, <laughs> you were like, hey, there's this guy named Ernie. I used to work with him when I was at Under Armour. I think you guys would, would uh, like really hit it off. Yeah. And run into him. Just say, what's up? <laughs> so I did. And kind of went from there, and then we ended up having him as a guest on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, also on that panel was Jacques Slade, the YouTuber. That's how I ended up meeting him as well. Damn. Um, so I had a conversation with him, uh, and also had him on as a guest. And then related to that, 
he used to work with someone named Jezreel Allen Lord, who is another guest of <laughs> our podcast. And uh, she was uh, on a show called, what was the name of the show? You Ain't Got These. And it was- You a Ain't Got These. And it a was Quibi a, show. Yes. Which is now Justin defunct, Peace. but is. the content has been purchased and will now be on another network. I don't know if they've announced really? it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Quibi, yeah, Quibi content is um, moving. Um, that's, me, that's great. Yeah. So it's not going to be, it's not going to disappear or after all. Um, <laughs> Roku actually acquired it. So, oh, um, dope. yeah. So Roku is going to be showing their content, like all the Quibi content. Because there's a lot of good stuff on there. It was. Um, yeah, so much. Um, yeah, you ain't got these. Yeah, but the reason I brought that up was because the person that uh, directed it, uh, Lena Waithe, kind of ties into our guest today. So, How? Let me know. <laughs> connect these. Connect that. I need you to connect the dots. Yeah. Uh, so they actually worked on, on projects together early on before everybody Damn. started actually doing movies and TV and big stuff. Insane. Um, yeah. And uh, who, 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 who do we have today? Numa Perrier. Numa Perrier. So yeah, we'll uh, take a break, get her in here, and we'll go from there. So hey, what's up? How's everybody doing? She's here. Our guest is here. Numa Perrier. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I guess we should start with maybe um, just tell me all the things that you do, and then we could kind of talk about our experience with ex <laughs> exposure to you, and then we'll kind of work oh, our way there. <laughs> so oh, I do so many things. OK. <laughs> uh, my name is Numa. I'm an actor. I'm a writer. I'm a director. I'm a producer, I'm a visual artist. Whoa. Um, I like to dance. I do- You do it all. Creative things, yes. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, I guess I should tell the story of how Ronald actually reached back out to you. So I run uh, a movie club and uh, I started it during quarantine. And one of the movies that I ended up showing last year was Jezebel. Oh. Um, and ironically enough, a few years ago, Ronald was like, hey, there's this thing on YouTube. Uh, it's called Black and Sexy TV. Um, I want you to check it out. He sent me the link. I was like, oh, yeah, for sure. You know, I subscribed, you know, watched a few things and obviously loved it. And then Ronald had brought the conversation back up to me. He was like, hey, you, you uh, seen Jezebel before? I was like, yeah. And then he was like, yeah. So the person that directed that also did Black and Sexy TV. She was a creator for it. I think we should interview her. And he was like, you know, I, I spoken to her once before. I should hit her up and see what it, I'm like. Yeah, man, go for it. See what happens. <laughs> no, my idea was I was gonna I was gonna ask you, and then you you'd say, hey, reach out to Numa at publicist.com and talk to me later. I thought I was gonna have to go through many layers, and I I appreciate you just you know, I, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so my first exposure to you. Um, was black and sexy TV. Um, and I guess uh, I was a very huge fan of what it was and what it is. And, you know, I guess it started on YouTube, right? It started from the movie, A, a Day to Be Black and Sexy. A Good Day. A Good Day to Be Black and Sexy. Yeah. Um, and what's your connection to that movie and how did black and sexy TV come about? Well, gosh, um, we will have to kick it all the way back to MySpace. I don't even know. <laughs> she looks like young tenderloins. I don't know. <laughs> you, you, and I, you and I are pretty close in age. I'm 37. I'm 37 years old. So we're pretty close. We're like the same generation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, on MySpace is kind of where I first started um, just expressing myself online as an artist. Okay. Um, I, had, I had a page and I had all this hard, <laughs> I would do uh, fo fo photo shoots every week or every other week. And I'd post the photos on there. I had a blog. Um, I would change my page every week. It would be like a different song. I had the whole, it was great for me and all of the things, mm. all of the uh, creative spaces that I really love to occupy because you could put all of that on a MySpace page. I really think they need to bring MySpace back. I know it was Word. pretty cool. <laughs> but 
how I ended up at being connected with A Good Day to Be Black and Sexy is Dennis, the director of the film. Also, he was on MySpace too and had like run across my page and slid in my DMs. Okay. <laughs> inbox <laughs> back in the day is what they called yeah, it. Yeah, the in my space inbox was, um, you know, the early DMs. So he said, I love your photography. I just, um, I just finished shooting this film called A Good Day to Be Black and Sexy. I would, you know, just love to talk to you about um, doing some photography for the film and some branding stuff, you know, like he recognized from my page that I have a knack at the branding and a certain sensibility that aligned with his. So we met up and, um, ended up like being together. We have a child together. Oh, now. wow. Uh, yeah. That's my baby daddy. <laughs> and, um, on my space, but he was in the editing phase of the movie. Mm. So I would come like sit during the edits and just offer support or feedback or whatever. And, um, when the film went to Sundance, there was a lot of buzz around the film and kind of a cult following developed around this film because it really was um, the first or one of the first indie black films that really touched on sexuality um, in an unapologetic way. It yeah. was, it was it, I really do believe that it set the tone for a lot of the films that came after that, even for just using the word black in the title yes yeah um, was already yeah. so boundary pushing and so i loved this and i ended up uh shooting the movie poster for the film oh uh, with, wow you know, like That's the distributors amazing. posters that they came up with i did the photography for it um and then black and sexy tv came out of that because the fans wanted more content mm. so more content um between myself dennis his cinematographer and another filmmaker, Janine Daniels, the four of us came together to start creating more content um, from the same characters. But then we started creating skits and sketches about unrelated characters to the film. And then we started posting those on YouTube and that naturally evolved into, we should start doing series. You know, just yeah. doing these little one-off sketches isn't enough, we should do something episodic. So then we wrote our first series and we just kept going from there. But it all started on YouTube. Uh, we built that up until we remained on YouTube, but also started our own pay streamer. So we were, I think again, one of the first. Yes. Um, the first that I knew of. One of the first indie streamers out there, definitely the first for a black audience, yes. you know, for us, for the culture. Um, and so I wrote and produced, I starred in one of the series um, and we just kept going. We just kept going and kept going and kept going. And that is really, was really a great training ground for me, but also just um, what I wanted to do, you yeah, know, to yeah. keep creating content and keep trying different things that otherwise, if we were trying to shop those things on our own, they may have never seen the light of day um, or that would have been such a long process to get it made that by the time it gets out, it's dated. And I think, you know, you see that a lot in films now. So all of that was really the background to me feeling confident to make my first feature film, Jezebel. Gotcha. And um, it was really the two of us having a similar sensibility and a similar care for our culture that we want to be seen as beautiful and sexy and normal yeah. as we are, you know, uh, nor normalize our culture. So that is the path that I've been on and, you know, continue to be on as I start directing more feature films. Gotcha. Yeah. So I, let's not, let's not get past Black and Sexy TV. It was, it is and was uh, one of probably the most innovative thing that I'd ever really experienced. And, you know, I consume a lot of media to, to see a, a group of people that had their own audience that was interacting with people. I, I loved your, your, your vlog post that you would have with Dennis where you just catch us up on the production process and yeah. when you were coming out with stuff. Um, and we, we got to talk about something. You and Dennis <laughs> are scouts for some amazing talent. 
Yes. Let, you, you, let's name some people. Dante, Dante it, name some people. No. Yeah. We got a list. Uh, so uh, Will Callett, which is ironic because he ended up being in Charm City Kings and we're both from Baltimore. So there was a connection yeah. there. Uh, Ashley Blaine Featherson, uh, you worked yeah. with her at one point. Um, obviously, uh, Issa made a cameo, and I believe in the couple. She yes. was there at one point. Yeah. Uh, in the early days, yeah. Some shout outs yeah. to Lena Waithe uh, yeah, in that series Lena. as well. Hello, Cupid. So, Courtney Burrell, who was in Sexless and Chef Julian. Yeah, I see him in a bunch of commercials Burrell, and TV shows. Black and sexy alum. Melvin Gregg. So Instagram star, super popular dude, sexless. Um, yes. <laughs> even Barrington, who is actually winds up being in your feature, who is in uh, Hello Cupid 3.0. Um, mm -hmm. Kalila Joy. I yes. see her in a ton of stuff. Contender, okay. Yes. Yeah, and and let's talk about Batwoman. Let's talk about Javicia. Amazing. But but these are all people that you picked. It's it's not like it's not like this. So if this were a one off thing, and there yeah. were a couple people, but this is like a stable of black, incredibly talented people. So tell me the process of finding the talent for the show, for the well, series. You know, I'm gonna say this. Um, I definitely think uh, black and sexy should get their dues, mm -hmm. and and me Numa Perrier for him <laughs> some people to get her dues, mm. uh, but all of these stars were already stars and just needed a platform to yeah. start, you know, exercising their muscle more, but also to um, be seen and start gaining their own followers and start gaining the attention of other casting directors and other writer directors and producers to bring them into all of the huge things that they're doing now and to, you know, the ones that weren't writing were inspired and started to write. The ones who were writing, we were producing their writing. Um, so there was a lot of, um, you know, of that fresh, early talent, um, but they already had the goods. It was right, just a right. matter of like, we had the platform, they had the goods and we were naturally gonna be drawn to each other. But I remember like with Javicia, she had auditioned for, uh, sexless mm. and was not cast at first, but I always remembered her. I had her in the back of my right, head right. Mm -hmm. and she was um, close to being cast in sexless. And then when that, the spinoff Chef Julian came along, mm. there was the perfect part for her. I still have the message from 2014 on Facebook. I hit her up and I said, <laughs> hey, you auditioned for Sexless. I remembered you. I remember you. There's another role. Are you interested? Like she didn't even need to audition. I'm like, I want you to come do this. Are you interested? And she was down. So she came and she did that and went on to do her thing. But Jeez. again- already a star, already on her way. Um, but I, I remember like hand picking her and saying, we gotta, we gotta make a place for her. Um, and yeah, everyone came through either spotting them on other videos uh, <laughs> or they would come in for casting and I think it's just a matter of our energy meeting their energy. Like they were there, hungry, talented, gorgeous, you yeah, know, yeah. and we had the roles for them, yeah. you know? And I think that, that, that that's the biggest thing. We should definitely get our props, but I believe that all of them were already on their way. Those shows need to get on own or something. Like they're so good. Uh, I There's still some that I watch to this day, that guy, being one of them, oh, I, it's my favorite. the <laughs> gift that keeps on giving. There's a mm -hmm. lot of little jokes in that show that just, yeah, it's just a really well-made show. Yeah, and then uh, I even missed the name, Deshaun Terry. So he's on The Morning Show, which oh, I love. Deshaun, yes. I love The Morning Show too. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. Just so many good series, so many good yeah, people. So naturally, that, that like the cream of the crop uh, were going to come through Black and Sexy TV because mm. there was, no other platform and we were looking for the best talent and that those were the best talent that needed that platform and yeah. so um yeah i you know i it's it's incredible yeah and how, how, how did that, that make you feel like seeing all these people having like this level of success years after you guys kind of like put 
projects together and you know work with these people and just see them on these these major platforms at this point well i feel like i feel excited i feel like yes that is correct that's how it should go um there's also a part of me that feels like gosh uh i wish that that could still be like within black ownership yes you no know, because that would be i amazing. know for a fact that um, everything that we did at Black and Sexy caught the attention of, uh, you know, the major networks who mm -hmm. are not Black owned, right. um, even the ones that, you know, try to appear as if they are, they're not, um, mm. that we, that, that our series caught their attention and they kind of came in like how a big company does when another little company is you know, they try to come in and just like take, yeah. you know? And so of course actors, they're stars and they should be on the biggest platform that they can get. So they should go and do that. But I, if there, if there's any like bittersweetness to it for me, it's that a platform like Black and Sexy TV does not have the capital right, right. <laughs> that, the other networks do to and and the reach that other networks do to keep the stars there, you know, and to, and to make that go as big as it can go. So that was the, there's always like a oh oh, you know, even me as a director, you know, it's like yeah, I want to go make these like bigger budget films and I want to do this thing, but it's like ah, oh, you also want to you also want to have that ownership and be able to have the full circle of it not just you're being plucked to go make money for this other big company that doesn't fully represent us so i i still have conflict about that mm. uh, but the excitement outweighs it but i do think about that yeah, i do think sure. about that a lot so, so you you also are an actress in your own right you you participated in some of the shows on black and sexy but i'm, I'm minding my business one day I turn on Showtime. Frankie Shaw. So, no. Are you minding your business? Oh. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody minds their business like this one. Right. Right. Just... But... Are you minding your business? <laughs> I don't know why I'm holding the remote like this either. <laughs> <laughs> and I see you on Smell. I, <laughs> I see you on Smell as his character, Elsie. Is she Haitian? Yes. So that, so you you are of Haitian descent. Yes. And, and you, this this character is so three dimensional, like a lot of characters in Frankie Shaw stuff. But how did this come about? And how did you like the experience of being on Showtime? And and, and you know it's. Gosh, I'm so sad that the show got canceled. I know it's uh, so good. Uh, no, it's like whole craziness went on, but um. I booked that role off an audition. I got mm. an audition, you know, in the middle of trying to like uh, raise finishing funds for Jezebel. Um, I got the audition, you know, for this Haitian, they said they were doing a special immigrant story because the, you know, the storyline of Smilf is about Frankie Shaw, yeah. um, you know, loosely based around her life, being a single mother trying to date and figure things out. But they decided to do a special, episode on immigrants that are like surrogate mothers to mm. white women's kids basically <laughs> <laughs> you know like they're the ones doing the cooking and the cleaning and the caring for the kids and they wanted to really show what what that looked like today so um it was a very funny role i put myself on tape and i just sent it out and it came back and they said um they really love you then they gave me a, a note and then I met with the executive producers and they're like, like, you got the part. It's a three episode thing. I was like, yes, it was like, this, you know, big like yeah. Yeah. time because, you know, I starred in the couple, which I treated just as, just like it was a Showtime series. So good. But, but when the couple got picked up by HBO, we couldn't make any more episodes of the couple. Mm black and sexy and so then i started being more behind the scenes because my character was so well known we kind of didn't know how to put me in another show because i was so known for being chick mm. so i started feeling frustrated as an actor like but i need to be acting too because yeah. this is my passion 
Um, but it was just like trying to figure out when and how I could roll into a new role mm. or am I going to go star in the HBO, the couple, but they, they shelved us. Oh, <laughs> so wow. it, was like, it was just a difficult time for, for me in that aspect. Um, so when the Showtime thing came through, I'm like, yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I went and did the role and she is very multidimensional. And I, I always say, if I'm going to play a mother, I want to have a sex scene. Like, I don't want to like, <laughs> play, I don't, you know, I don't want to no, just like go be the mom, yeah. you know, like just go because this character needs a mom and you fit the casting. So right. we're going to get her to come. Nah, like. You're going to have some sex. <laughs> Moms yeah. have sex. Right. Yes, yes. So I was really excited about that. And I had such a great co-star um, in Jimmy Jean-Louis. And <laughs> yeah, I got to be well-rounded. We got to speak Creole. I got to dance. I got to, you know, be a full human being. And the, that episode got a lot of buzz, actually. Like, kind of like early Emmy buzz around that episode. Mm -hmm. But Alas, Damn. <laughs> Alas. Um, the series didn't continue, but uh, I'm still very close with Frankie. And I think, you know, we may work on something else in the future. So that'd be amazing. She's so talented. You know, I, th I think amazing. that she really inspired me. She was it was I really think that role came into my life for a reason, not mm -hmm. just for me, um, not just for me being able to satisfy finally getting to really act in a juicy role again, but also because she was on set with her son. Mm. They were filming very similar to how we would film black and sexy stuff, very organic, lots of handheld. Um, she wasn't precious about her scripts. You could improv on top oh. of it. And that's how we work at black and sexy. So it was the first time I saw someone kind of in in that position who is a mother telling a story that's close to her um we just really clicked like once she learned that i'm a director and producer and stuff as well we we became really close so oh, that's, that's incredible yeah, yeah. um so you was minding about... your business and you caught my <laughs> episode <laughs> I, was, I don't know why i did i don't what was was channel <laughs> yeah. oh. yeah, it was explicit. It was a pretty explicit sex scene. And I remember I had lunch with Jimmy, and you know, we knew that we had this scene, and I had seen other episodes of Smell, so I know that yeah. like Frankie is very unfiltered. Yeah. And I, yeah. I love working that way. Um mm. but I remember telling Jimmy, I said, if we're gonna do this scene people need to feel like it's real. Like that is, that is my, that is the bar I'm holding us to. Like when they see this, they need to be like, oh my God, did they really just fuck? Like, really <laughs> and he was game, he was game and such a gentleman and he was completely game for it. And you know, I'm proud of what we did, but. Dope. It was intense. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was like, are they in love now? <laughs> like, are they in love? There's no way that you could be that close to somebody and not catch feelings. This, yeah, I, 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 I love, okay. love okay. that room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a sensitive we're soul. Okay. We're, we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's really so, cool. Like, I'm super impressed by everything that you do creatively. Um, at what stage in life did you figure out like this is like what I want to tap into? Was it early on or did you figure that out like when you were like in your late twenties? When when did you like really start to lean into like being actor, director, all those type of very early on, um, I knew I wanted to be an actress probably since I was five or six years old. I've been writing since I was seven or eight years old. Um, the directing piece of it, I didn't see at first. I started having kind of fantasies about directing um, in theater class. Like I would, because there would always be a director or the teacher would be the director of whatever mm -hmm. program we were doing. And I would kind of fantasize myself in that role, but it never really clicked to me that I wanted to do that as a career or that even that career was possible. I knew I wanted to be in movies but I didn't know how movies were made. Yeah. And mm. um, it was a combination of being in my acting class with other directors. And so, so there would be maybe 50 people in the acting class and maybe five or seven were directors. So 
sometimes their scenes would be directed scenes would get a critique from our teacher and the director would sit on stage with the actors and talk about what they it was almost always a man uh you know what he what he intended to do with the scene and why he chose these actors why he chose that material and i would sit there and as much as i loved getting up there and acting the scenes i loved listening to what the director was saying. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to really realize that's where I really caught the directing bug was mm. sitting in the acting class, listening to directors talk about their process, seeing how those scenes always seemed more elevated than the than the scenes where the act we were just on our own as actors trying to figure it out and yeah. learn this process. Um, so that's where I caught the bug. And then in that class, they would encourage us or it became part of the curriculum to start filming yourself um, and filming yourself in different scenes, filming yourself doing monologues. And so we would go pair off with our friends and fil start filming these scenes. And those were my early films. Oh, That's how I ended up making my first amazing. short film. Once I made that first short film and I saw the impact and the, the power of that um, and the excitement that I had for the entire process, that's when I realized I'm a filmmaker. Gotcha. Like, oh. That's amazing. oh, wow. So it all, you know, it all came, it all naturally came through there. And I always had a love for photography and images. So it was just okay. the pairing of photography, writing, acting, and listening to other directors and their process and seeing how it developed. I just jumped in there and now I, I know I do all of it. So that's amazing. And like working with those multi hyphenate people, like during the black and sexy TV, like Lena and Issa, and like, I think you made a cameo on awkward black girl at one point, right? I did. Like how, how did that help you in your process and your development? I'm like y'all did all the research. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, we're not, we're no slouches. My, uh, my cameo with Issa Rae when I snuck her. <laughs> oh my God. We had to rehearse that a lot. Um, yeah. But it was, I think we all fed off of each other's energy and we all fed off of, you know, the competitiveness of like, who's dropping the next episode and who's coming up with a new series. And it was a mm. very, very, fertile time where we were sharpening ourselves against each other. That's the best way I can describe it. So um, yeah, that's, that's what it was. It was our own kind of self-created playground of people who were very ambitious, you know, and very creative and like really wanting to be seen and heard. So yeah, it was, it was natural that we would all come together and, you know, uh, partner up in different ways like we did that's so, amazing so i noticed there's like a connective tissue between um a lot of what you do and some of it is like you know parts of who you are and so when jezebel came along is a semi-autobiographical movie correct it's like part of your life that's autobiographical. oh it is all okay completely yeah. okay oh, wow. <laughs> let me ask you let me ask you a question so oh, y'all gonna learn today man. <laughs> So the the movie is about sex work, and I have a question for you before we go into uh, how you came a, a across, you know, wanting to write the script. Mm -hmm. COVID is here, and there is, is a crazy influx yes. in sex work. I wanted work. to talk about this too. I'm glad you brought that how up. How do you feel, Numa, about the idea of how sex work has become a little more mainstream and... Um, how do you feel about the empowerment that's happening right now? Yeah, because like even when we uh, showed the movie for my movie club, that was part of the conversation. I'm like, oh, this is like like OnlyFans, like the early stages. Obviously, this is the early, 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 yeah. it's man, a, like you know? early inception of the internet, and like the term cam girl wasn't like even coined at the time, but right. it was like super, I guess, relevant moving it into where we were at that time. Well, um, sex work is work. Yeah. And, yeah. but that's not to say that it's not complex, you know? So I think that there, there's a lot to be said under that umbrella. Um, but the destigmatization, destigmatization and the um, hopefully decriminalization of sex mm -hmm. work is, is something that I'm passionate about and that I think should happen. Um, 
more and more. So with the stigma part is definitely still there, but there is a mainstreamness of it. There's more, you know, there's like a new lexicon around <laughs> sex work now. And, and um, there's, you've got almost every famous person talking or joking or singing about and only fans and I'm like well maybe they even low key do have one and we all know about. Are, yeah. Yeah. Like about that I said I was going to start only only fans just for my feet you know just for all the <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, I love out there, you know and you know I believe that a lot of people would sign up for my my toesies numerous toesies yeah, totally um, fans. <laughs> Fans, you know, so there's many ways that you could do it, OnlyFans. Um, so it it tickles me, and it also uh, it it makes me smile. You know, yeah. I'm I'm glad that there's a there's a platform for safer sex work uh, for for whoever wants to go and go in there. You know, and also just for the exploration of sensuality and for you know, the openness to different kinks and fetishes, I think that there, that that should be something that is not so repressed. Yeah. Um, and I've always felt that way. And of course, like, I'm one of the founders of Black and Sexy TV, you know? <laughs> yeah. And my early, early days as a cam girl, I would have never connected those two because when I left that job, I, looked at it as a dirty little secret that I was never going to tell anybody, even though I was journaling about it a great deal and starting to conceive it as a film. Mm -hmm. um, I really felt like I had to put a lot of distance between that and what I do today, when actually they're very married to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and the things that I care about today are directly related to that. So, oh, wow. Yeah, Crazy. That's, that's how I see it. I see it as a continuum of, you know, part of my purpose is to push that envelope, is to challenge what society says about sex and Black women and what we desire and how we uh, commodify ourselves. Um, yeah, I think that's part of what my voice is here for. Yeah. And I think what we like to do here is kind of demystify the the whole process of creation and make sure people understand that it's not always glamorous and like uh did some research for like your whole process for the film like you really worked hard to to get that done you shot it in a super short period um to save money i think you like even stayed at location that you guys were filming at and like i think post-production you guys uh, had to do like some crowdfunding for post-production right oh yeah um it was a truly indie experience but I was used to it because mm -hmm. it was all blood sweat and tears and very indie to get every series on black and sexy done you know and it was a matter of like pulling the right team together that was really willing to be in the trenches and I really learned how to be super resourceful so going into a feature film I felt confident that I could do it <laughs> um with a small budget. I felt mm. confident that I could do it within a certain amount of days because I'd had practice for six, seven years of getting an episode out every single Sunday, you know, yeah. so you have to turn those episodes around fast. And it, well, so how many, so if you do that a few times, that's the length of a feature right there. So I'm like, well, mm. if we're able to do it for this episodic so fast, I should be able to do it for with the right script in a feature. So I, I was able to identify um, by learning on set, um, what makes your day go longer? What makes your day go quicker? Uh, what looks best on camera? Uh, when you if you are going to only do a couple of locations, how to actually still make that a rich visual experience. All of those things are through the trial and error of uh, what was all done for the web at the time. So I went in pretty confident and, and I think that that energy and that confidence, the team around me, a lot of them I had worked with on series, on Black and Sexy series as well. Mm, okay. So they already knew the flow of it and like, this is how we're gonna get this done. We don't do a ton of takes. We don't do a ton of coverage. Um, this, is, this is how it's gonna get done. So everyone had the same mindset and the same excitement because it was everyone's first feature. 
Right. So um, everyone came in with the same sense of wonder, like, oh, I've always wanted to do a feature or be in a feature. And, you know, um, Numa's got this story and we, we want to help her tell it, you know. So yeah. there's just a lot of enthusiasm that carried us a long way, but a lot of just practical knowledge and experience from doing it for hundreds of episodes <laughs> right. you know, years yeah so I, I mean one of the cool things about that is when you're when you're working on an indie budget sometimes some of the you don't have the crazy drone shots around the building you you're just doing the content and there's something about the flow of the movie that feels very natural it feels the way that i want a story to be told i don't want to see the side shot of LA is, you know, I, I don't yeah, want to, yeah. I just want to hear the story told, you know, and you tell an incredible story with a lot of nuance to it because there is some, some nuance with the conversation of sexuality and sex work and somehow sometimes where people can't separate the two where somebody that's in the industry can, can separate it. Cause it is a job yeah. for, for people. Right. So, yeah. right. How did you how did you work on creating that nuance? Because there is some, or is it just natural? I guess because it's your story that you're able to. I think it's sensibility, mm. you know, and and I think that it's tied to just the things that I'm drawn to, the things the things that I love and the eye that I've developed over the years. I've always been um, more drawn to something that's stripped down, that exercises restraint. Uh, that's, that's what turns me on cinematically. You know, mm. when I see that the director could have made this choice, but they, they leaned back instead of like putting the lacquer on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And even in, um, when I look at artists who paint, for example, um, I'm always more drawn to their sketches like, you know, if I go visit an artist at their studio and they may have these amazing paintings, mm. I always ask them, can I see some of your sketches? Do you sketch as well? Do you sketch before you paint? And when they show me those sketches, I, I'm i more in love with those. Like I want, I want to collect those. Um, and I think that just applies to my filmmaking sensibility. I like the more stripped down version of almost everything. So, gotcha. um, so I definitely applied that to, to every choice I made in my film. Yeah. Um, when you write these things that are so close to you and so personal, does it feel like therapy to you? Because like, I would imagine some of these, these stories that you are telling you, you feel super connected to and super personal to. So being able to, to share that with people, even like through some of the stuff I do, like, I feel nervous about it. So does it does it help you like personally when you when you tell these stories and show these stories? Yeah, I mean it helps to have a therapist and walk you through some of the things that you didn't didn't know were gonna, you know, fly in your face, you know. And I was um seeing a therapist at the time, you know, during part of the filmmaking and she asked me questions that I hadn't asked of myself. Mm. And I think, you know, that helped me look at the film in a different way and look at what I went through and how I processed it to survive. Um, so I don't know if the process of doing it feels like therapy, but I did have therapy while I was doing it because mm. I was revisiting a lot of trauma. Um, and those, even with the very first film, my very first short film is about um, my mother who passed away, um, it was about her, how we had a role reversal and I was taking care of her. I was like her mom taking care of her in the last uh, days and, you know, years of her life. And I, that was my very first short film. And I remember the first time I saw it on a big screen, I had a trauma response, you oh, know, wow. I just kind of um, shut down and really went through a lot emotionally because I didn't have a therapist then. And I didn't know like how hard that was gonna hit me to have all those memories come crashing back at me. So by the time I made my feature, um, I had the right support gotcha. for that. So um, this, this was a little different. You, you, you play your sister, right? If I'm not mistaken, you played your sister. Yeah. So you're watching yourself 
<laughs> go through the things that you went through when you were younger. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think it could have been anything more triggering than watching yourself go through these things. And to have the right system in place must have been amazing to kind of, you know, yeah. take take the shock away from some of it. Because I, I I was watching this movie thinking like, oh my goodness, this is this is Nuba going through these things, you know, in 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 this industry being, uh, you know, some of the some of the scenes where people when people question your worth sometimes that is such a dramatic situation sometimes like to have it happen in front of people and you're not worth this much money and you should do this and I, you know, I, I felt it. I felt it. Yeah. How did that feel watching yourself be in these scenarios? Well, it was awesome to have a sense of vindication about mm. it. Like, mm. you know, look at, first of all, look at me now. I am the filmmaker and actor that I always intended to be, no matter what I had to go through to get there, you know, mm. which was like early acting and filmmaking to, to really keep it real, <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> I said, you know what? I was a cam girl. I learned how to frame myself. I learned how to light myself. Oh, wow. I learned what looked good on me. I learned how to do what I'm doing now with you, which is connect with you when you're not even in the room. Like, right. I hope you can feel me. Yeah, yeah. I feel right. you. But that's, you know, in the early cam girl days, I wouldn't be able to see you. You could only see me. So it's like all on me to like exude the energy that's yeah. going to penetrate that screen. Yeah. You know, so watching Tiffany Tanil, who's playing me, um, and she did a marvelous job. It was more exciting and, and yeah, that sense of vindication than anything else. It was like, yeah, and it was kind of fun to revisit it. Like now I can just like go in and reshape it and I can appreciate my sister and what she went through. Mm. Um, because I never really considered what she was going through because I was so occupied with my own survival at the time. So it was really a full circle thing. Um, and I think, yeah, with the support of therapy, uh, was, it was a great experience for me to go through that and revisit all of those things. Yeah. Follow-up question. You weren't tempted to like change the past, like back to the future, like you go into the cam guy's office and you punch him in the nuts and he's like, I'll never do this. And you take all the money out of the safe and you like set it off at the end or something like that. You never got... <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying you, <laughs> you never got tempted to change your past to this movie. You're like, man, this is the best story ever. I kicked that. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, this is what I'll say. I'll say that 90% uh, of it is what I really went through. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did ask for more money. I was treated like, no, we're not going to do that. Right, right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the exact way that scene plays out, I took a little bit of license with it, like how much power, you know, mm -hmm. she does seem to have at the end. Mm -hmm. I probably didn't feel like as empowered. Um, but for the most part, like what you're seeing in there is what happened oh wow <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. it's I what i went that. through and i felt like that that was not something i wanted to change i wanted to live as close to the truth of my memory as you know like memory works on us in different ways um but that is how i remember it yeah and you know i i, I wanted to remain dedicated to the truth That's i appreciate that honestly for sure and then like i think that is what makes the work that you put out like relevant, timeless, and like even though that took place in like the the late nineties, like I said, it's still even applied to what's going on right now. And then yeah. what's funny was I went back and watched a couple episodes of the couple and I was like, if you take like the just isolate it and put it into 2020, 2021, like that work from home uh, episode when you're standing behind him and he's trying to work and then he goes outside. I was like, that could happen today. Like, because Absolutely. a lot of people working from style. home. Yeah. <laughs> or like them driving in the car together and, you know, having yeah. arguments about directions. I was like, I went through that type of scenario before. So like, it's super relatable sure. and, and <laughs> that's super appreciated. Yeah, I really um, love and sometimes, you know, really miss the couple and what we were able to do there. A lot of that was pulled from real life, real life experiences, whether it was with Dennis or with um, other people that we had been with, you know, yeah. but just like just the, all the little details 
of living with someone <laughs> versus when you were just dating yeah. is really what the couple is all about. And just how like spending so much time with that one person, how that just brings out all of your annoying qualities, yeah. but also reflects back like all of their annoying qualities. Yeah. And um, you know, sometimes I still want that outlet, you know, like <laughs> something happened, like, uh, we would have wrote that down for the couple for sure. We <laughs> that, you know, like one of my favorite episodes from the couple was dishes, you know, oh, and yeah, so, like yeah. within every couple, there's always something with the dishes. There's one person always. who does them, one person who doesn't, or they both don't yeah. and they like present each other. And there's, a, a, you know, just things like that. I like to reflect back just the realness of it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so Jezebel got distribution through Netflix. So tell me about that feeling. I, Cause there's nothing <laughs> like, Netflix is the gift that keeps on giving. So how did how did it how did it come about? How did it feel? How does it continue to feel? Because people okay. keep reading. I'm going to give you guys the the story story of Please. how Jezebel got out there because um, there's some details that I don't think I've talked about as much. Uh, one is we made the film in July 2017, mm -hmm. the day after uh, 4th of July, we drove out to Las Vegas. We started filming, we spent a week there. We came back to LA to find the second location for the chat rooms. We filmed uh, four more days. So it was 10 total shooting days. Wow. So we finished filming by August. We were all done by August. Um, so the deadline for Sundance is, I think the late deadline is late September or early October, something like that. So I was trying to get my film done in time for that Sundance. Whoa. Which is crazy. That right? is crazy. That's legitimately Intense. crazy. Okay. So um, of course, like what we sent wasn't even done. Of course we're not getting into Sundance with that, you know? Um, and the deadline for South by Southwest, I think is a month later. Mm -hmm. So I'm like trying to like rush this movie into these deadlines. Um, I didn't expect to get into Sundance, but it, it still burned, but I thought we might have a shot at South by Southwest. So when I got the call that we did not get in to South by Southwest mm. in 2018, I was crushed. Mm realistically i shouldn't have been crushed because we weren't done with the movie we were still editing the movie but i had just sent them what we had so far yeah so once i finally picked myself up from that i was pretty devastated because i just wanted the film to be part of that 2018 sundance cycle right, um right. And it wasn't and that was really that was a, a year of depression for me but we finished the film i submitted it again I'm like, this is the film I want it to be now. I submitted it to South by Southwest again and we got in. So that wow. was like the first big hurdle of um, just learning that a no can turn into a yes, <laughs> not with consent, <laughs> but with <laughs> filmmaking, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. Because in case anyone want to try to edit what I said, <laughs> so not you, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, so in filmmaking, uh, a no can turn into a yes. <laughs> so, um, so then I had up on my wall the names of places I want where I wanted the film to be, and Netflix was at at the top of that list. Mm -hmm. And the film was sent to so many distributors, including Netflix. And the feedback I always got was, we love this film. It's so special, but no, it's a pass, including Netflix. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, and I'm just like, well, if you love the film, I started getting angry because sometimes they would write me paragraphs of why they love the film and still and say, say no. no. Wow. I'm like, you know, I, it's just that conflicting feeling of, you know, they're trying to give you a sincere, maybe they were, they went to bat for your film, but they just couldn't get it through the final, right. whoever that makes the final decision. So I, I understood it and I tried to be as gracious as possible, but I was like, oh, like burning inside. Mm. And so uh, we had also sent the film over to Array and it took a while before we got a response and, um, 
I, Ava was the publicist for A Good Day to Be Black and Sexy. So oh. I knew her and I had <laughs> You know, I knew her and she was definitely very aware of me in the film and had, you know, tweeted about Jezebel and gave money to my crowdfunding. But I hadn't reached out to her personally about Array distributing my film, mm -hmm. but the film had been sent. And so when we didn't hear back, I said, you know, I should just email her directly, you mm -hmm. know, and tell her why I think Array would be a great home for the film. So I did that. I said, just follow your impulse and why are you letting your representatives speak yeah, for you? Speak right. to this woman yourself, you know? So I sent an email and I, you know, said all the reasons why I think um, Jezebel should be at Array. They emailed back right away and said that the team was taking a look at it. So a um, couple weeks later, my phone rang and it was Ava DuVernay <laughs> on the phone. Wow. <laughs> And uh, I started screaming. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. she told me that the team watched the film. She told me she was proud of me. And um, because she's known me ov over the years. And she said she was very proud of me, that the team loved the film, and that they wanted to put their Black woman elbow grease behind it to wow. get it out and array has a distribution deal with Netflix. And so a circle. what I had written on my wall <laughs> <laughs> did come true. Oh my it God, festation. Similar to me submitting a bad cut of my film or early cut, I should say mm -hmm. a rough cut, mm -hmm. um, turned into a yes once I got it together my film found the right home and Array is the perfect home for my film. Um, I don't know if another distributor would have put the same care into it that Array has put into it. So, but I also learned that don't let your representatives do all the speaking for you. Right. Because wow. an email like that is kind of just like copy and paste and very dry. Yeah. Whereas my email was personal. Yeah. and um, was clear about the vision for the film. So that's a lesson learned. Yeah. <laughs> I think, especially for our community, it's like, yeah, just because you start having a team, you're still the leader of that team. And if you can be the one doing the speaking, like you said to me, you thought I was gonna respond to you with the email my publicist <laughs> so that we could like talk on podcast. I'm not saying I'm never gonna have a publicist that people need to be yeah. referred to. I'm mm. sure that's very near in the future, but as much as I can, I'm gonna go straight to source and talk straight to, because I can always just say no right. as well. Right, you right, know, absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah. But, you know, as far as us being able to talk and as being able to come together and partner up on things, we got to talk to each other yeah. because no one else speaks the way that we speak and no one else is going to speak for your film, your project, your business, whatever it is, no one's going to speak for it the same as you would, you know? And so it's like, I knew that, but I had to remind myself of that. And that's when everything turned around for Jezebel. So. Wow. That's amazing. And and speaking of Array and Ava and that whole Black girl magic energy that's over there, <laughs> you were able to work on Queen Sugar, right? Yeah. So then uh, she invited me to direct Queen Sugar before the team had uh, even watched the film. Oh. Or, you know, oh. Before. So she knew I had gotten to South by Southwest and she likes to tap feature filmmakers, women, mm -hmm. to come direct on Queen Sugar. So she actually slid in my DMs that time. Mm -hmm. Wow. I still have the message on Twitter. In my <laughs> <laughs> That's how she invited me to come work on Queen Sugar. She said, I think you're a wonderful filmmaker and I would love it if you would join, you know, our cast of directors and, and come do an episode for us. And I was like, what? <laughs> wow so I cried. I cried I'm gonna say I cried I, I probably <laughs> would have done more than that I probably would have fainted a little bit Word. so so okay let's uh, Jezebel 
Um, all of your work on Black and Sexy TV, um, you did the art for the for the film. I'm, uh, for the uh, a good day to be Black and Sexy. Mm -hmm. I'm noticing something. These movies, these shows, light Black people up in a way, light them in a way that I just have never seen before. This is like the these are the only creative things that I've ever seen. Queen Sugar your shows, your movie, especially your movie, black people being lit properly, like not mm -hmm. seeing them look too dark and just seeing us. I'm not trying to be weird, but like black people are filmed terribly a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, you, you're involved in projects where black people are lit very well. I, you know, do you pay attention to that? Uh, is it very important to you? Is it, you know, I'm just you asking. Now, do you see this light on my phone? <laughs> <laughs> you try, yeah, it, it's, it. Listen. You know, I, first of all, I am crazy about lighting. Um, mm. Even just from a creative standpoint, I want to design lights. Oh, wow. You know, I, I have, these are light gels on my wall. I just, I love oh, wow. lighting. I love wow. light fixtures. I love gels. I've always loved that from a young age. So lighting is important to me. Um, Black people looking as beautiful as we look and radiating the light that we do absorb in our skin back mm. out onto the screen, that's vital, that's so cinematic. And that's how we represent the lights that we are. You know, we are lights, black people are lights. We, yeah. we have all this light in us. And wow. so to not light us right is, it's just a complete disservice to not only who we are in our humanity, but to the project. You know, because we will pop off at any screen if we're lit right. Yeah, sure. yeah. It's so simple, you know, oh. it's so simple. So I've always really, really cared about it. Um, again, even back in my cam girl days, I had like my life <laughs> lit myself a certain way. I cared about that shit, sure, you know, sure. and I, I care about it. So one thing I learned and always because I've always loved lights and cameras no matter what project I've ever worked on the first person I go and shake hands with is the cinematographer mm. as an actor right right you know? and I think that actors sometimes kind of ignore that person and because they're so focused on like getting the approval of the director yes I care about my directors but as an actor I care about my cinematographer I will always go to my cinematographer or get to know them and make sure that um I even used to say please give me my preferred lighting and preferred framing you know <laughs> I would say it kind of like as a joke but they would be like I got you you know and I would notice they would take a little extra care and just make sure I was good so um Yes, uh, love love on your cinematographers. And then as a director, uh, choosing the right cinematographer who has that sensibility, who cares, um, who sees who sees that we are lights and is inspired by that to light us properly if they're not black themselves. <laughs> wow. You know, um, it's just always been vital to me and I, will never ever step away from that. And it's not just lighting, it's framing. Mm. You know, it's the right. whole package of what a cinematographer does, but the light is vital. It, it just is. I mean, without light, we don't have life. Yeah. Wow, we are light. I've never heard that before about us. That blew my mind. I'm sorry. I've, <laughs> I'd never heard that. I've never heard that before. I have a, um, my, I have a good friend, uh, Pierre Benou, and um, he often talks about the way that black people are lit. We talk about it a lot. Every time we talk about something, work. you know, you know, here's work. Yeah. <sighs> so whole world. So he, he does stand up and we do stand up. To, we've done stand up together a couple of times. I was on a couple of his shows. Incredibly nice dude. And he talks a lot about light. When we talk about movies, it's like the first thing he talks about. He's like, man, and the black people were lit well. I'm like, OK, I'm going to pay more attention to this. And ever since we became friends, I'm like checking everything. I'm like, oh man, this is, it's cool that you value that. Yeah. Yeah. I I always will. I always will. Uh, it's just, it's so important. And I think much more people are, are aware of that now. Mm. And um, you're starting to see black cinematographers start to rise a little bit. I want that to move a little faster. I want there to be more. Um, but it's good to see that there are some now 
but if if you're not working with a black cinematographer they have to just be that white person <laughs> or non-black person right. they need to be enamored with us and they need to recognize our light and they need to be of service to it wow. or they can't work on my project damn word that's amazing um another thing that i i I, I noticed uh, you did a sit down with with Jordan Peele, uh, who is big in the thriller genre. And I also read that you were working on a thriller project. Um, yes, I have a Jordan Peele story. <laughs> 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 okay, so um, I have a similar story for a few people, but I, I'm going to tell it about Jordan because it's relative to you bringing him up. Um, so I had never watched Key and Peele mm. until maybe a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, when I met first met Jordan, he was dating a friend of mine who he's now married to. And we were at a screening together for <laughs> our mutual friend. And we were waiting in line to get into the screening. And she had told me that she was dating a new guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cool. So I'm going to meet, you know, your boyfriend. And she's like, you know, this is my boyfriend, Jordan. And I said, hi, boyfriend, Jordan. I didn't know who you were. <laughs> didn't think anything of it. Now I had a couple of friends in the line behind me who were freaking out. Like, <laughs> are, you, are you not saying her name because you're not trying to name drop? Are you not Chelsea Peretti? Yeah, Chelsea Peretti. I'm, because One I'm of not the funniest. To, yeah, I'm not trying to. Uh, you yeah, yeah. Up Jordan, okay? <laughs> yeah, you're gonna be like, <laughs> so Jordan. my friend and not Chelsea <laughs> Peretti is killing. So I didn't just like randomly get this interview yeah. with him. I, I met him. I. My first thing I ever said to him was, hi, boyfriend, Jordan. Because <laughs> literally, I just thought this is just the new guy that she yeah. met. Like, yeah. Fine, whatever. Um, I didn't know. I'd never seen him in my life. <laughs> okay, So my friends behind me are freaking out. And after the screening, they said something to me. And I'm like, what? You know, like, I, I did not know who they were talking. I didn't know what they meant. And then... I saw the show, mm. and, you know, or like looked it up, figured it out. I was like, oh, okay. So um, every time I saw him from there, there was just like a comfort because of how we first <laughs> had interacted with each other was so casual and so like, cool, welcome to the family, kind of like that, you know? And um, so when, so when Get Out came out, I had already read the script. I auditioned for that role, the Georgina, no, 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 no. Oh, wow. Role. Um, and so I was, I knew that this film was going to be a hit. Mm. And just from reading the script, I was like, this is, this is on a whole, whole other level. So I reached out to him and said, you know, will you come talk about the film on Black and Sexy? And he, he drove down to our house at the time in Limerick Park and came and, you know, sat in our living room and, and we chopped it up about the film. But I had that extra knowledge um, of the script. So mm. I knew where he had deviated from the script oh, and wow. we were able to have a really rich conversation, but also just like a comfort with one another. Uh, that's why it, it, there was ease in the room, you know, yeah. but yeah, I'll just never forget that story. <laughs> they were just like freaking out and just falling over themselves. Um, yeah, so that's my Jordan Peele story. <laughs> <laughs> Boyfriend Jordan. <laughs> that's so funny. So, so you have a thriller coming out soon? You're 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 directing, writing. What's what's? I'm working on something. Well, now I'm working on a lot of things. Okay. Um, my the next film that I'm directing is for Netflix. I'm doing a, a rom com with Gabrielle Union and Keith Powers. Um, and I know yeah. Keith Powers. I've seen him before. He's the he's a light skinned dude with the. I know. I keep. Let me look up Keith Powers. How I don't. How shall you describe him? <laughs> He's an emerging star. <laughs> oh, uh, Keith Powers. Yes. yes, Keith Powers. Yes. yes. I know exactly who this guy is. He's really very talented. He was in New Edition. Mm -hmm. Yes, very so talented. talented. So, um, 
So there's a love story about the two of them that I'm directing. That's what oh. I'm doing next. It's based on a book. It's called The Perfect Find. Mm. And um, yeah, it's about a woman dating a younger man, but then finds out that that's her boss's son. So you've got kind of an unusual type of love triangle going on. Um, I'm excited about it. That's going to happen pandemic pending this summer. Okay. We were supposed to film like six months ago in New York, but as you know, uh, things have been shuffled. Right. Um, my thriller is another autobiographical piece um, about, but it's, I'll, I'll call that more semi, but not really. The, what happened did happen to me. It's more of a psychological thriller um, because I was adopted. I was born in Haiti, but adopted at a young age. Mm -hmm. And my family that adopted me uh, said that I could meet my biological mother, my blood mother, it's called blood mother. They said I could meet my blood mother uh, when I turned 18. So when I turned 18, I met my blood mother and she's living in Miami now, but we went to Haiti together. And while we were there, I kept feeling like I was being set up to be kidnapped or something. Oh, wow. So that they could try to like extract my ransom from my family yeah. in the States. My family in the States didn't have any money, but relative to what was going on and what's been going on in Haiti, mm -hmm. they did. Cause there were just a series of things that happened while I was in Haiti. Like I wasn't able to call home. There was always some reason why I couldn't get a call through or there was no phone available. Um, and just, there were just like a series of things that happened. So the movie is really about the psychology of if you can't trust your mother, who can you trust? And oh, I didn't know wow. who I, if I didn't know if I could trust my mother in the United States. And I didn't know if I could trust my mother in Haiti. And I'm being exposed to a culture that I relate to, but I've never been part of. Mm. Um, and so there's all of those fears and things and your imagination starts going wild or is it your imagination, you know? And so uh, that's what Blood Mother is about. And I'm excited about making that film because I'm pretty sure I'm gonna do it mostly indie kind of how I did Jezebel maybe mm. with a little more money mm. um but really just do whatever I want with that like I'm not looking to like place that in someone's hands that's gonna you know kind of like my Netflix movie there's gonna be like a lot of voices yeah. in that um to a certain extent but you know it's right. a studio movie and yeah. what I want to do with Blood Mother is keep it as close as I can to the process of how I did Jezebel so that you're getting all of that rawness of what I went through then, but it's a thriller. Two, I two things. I wait to see that. Take my money now. <laughs> and we have to be able to, you have to promise us that you'll come back so we can talk to you about that. That yes. sounds insane. Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. Uh, your life is like a series of a very interesting events. And I, I'm, Tell tell all of those stories. I cannot wait to. Yes. What they tried to kidnap. Wow. Listen, and I'm here today, so that's how I can tell those stories. But I remember vividly, you know, the feelings that I went through and very specific things that you'll see in the film. Um, but yeah, I I have I have had this very unorthodox, wild ride you know, of a childhood and early adulthood. And now I'm having a different type of wild ride that's, you know, more in my control, more deliberate, mm. but I'm definitely gonna continue to mine all of those stories because I survived those things for a reason so that I could tell those stories. Yeah. Um, so I feel like it's it's my job to do so. So I'll be doing that. That's wow. amazing. Um, I also saw there was a project called Toxic that you're working on, a series. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Toxic is another thriller. Um, and it's also semi, I'm going to say semi auto wow. for that one because of the thriller aspect of it. Okay. Um, but it's, it's, I call it a love story gone wrong. And, you know, it's based on a series of relationships that I've had where the love is there and then it turns toxic. 
And so it raises a lot of questions around um, who all contributes to that. It's never just from one source and how are toxic cycles formed and how are they broken? And that's a series about a very messy relationship. Wow. Have, have you ever gotten a text like, Numa, is that me in episode three? Or this? <laughs> no. <laughs> we had conversations that might have been difficult to have. Me and you went out for Chinese. That's me. You're right. <laughs> like, I can't. Definitely, this series comes out, I'll, I'm going to get a few more phone calls. But, you know, if you're in my life or if you're in a writer's life, I mean, you both should know that, you know, yeah. that. Yeah. Um, it's all up for grabs, baby. And even in my current relationship marriage, <laughs> um, I say, you know what, I'm going to write that down because <laughs> that was very script worthy, what just happened. You know? <laughs> and sometimes it'll be like during a very intimate moment. And I'm like, oh my God, they've never seen that stuff like that before. So I got to, sorry, I got to write that down, you know? <laughs> So you'll be seeing, um, you'll be seeing that we're we're finding a home for that series right now. But I'm, I'm doing that with Macro TV. Okay. That's okay. Charles King's company. Gotcha. That's incredible. So, um, you know, we talked about your ability to tell stories. Um, which storytellers are you a fan of right now? Um, which with with uh, people are telling stories right now, or have done series or movies in the past couple of years are kind of on your radar um, that you've reached out, maybe reached out personally and said something to, or I, you know, you, you, you told me that Ava was kind of watching you without really telling you, I, you know, are there, is there anybody else that you're kind of, you have your eye on that you admire? Uh, so many people, um, so many great films uh, came out last year, especially mm -hmm. uh, Channing Godfrey Peoples. I adore, like, I literally stalk her. I loved Miss mm -hmm. Juneteenth so much. So good. It was yes, one of my favorite, good. favorite films of last year. Um, and we're very friendly with each other. And, you know, like I reach out to her, I'm like, I want to be like filmmaker buddies with you. She's like, I want to be your filmmaker buddy too. And so <laughs> we're kind of just like buddies from a distance. But um, I'm really looking forward to see. I think she just got a first look deal at. Universal or one of the major studios. Wow. So she's got more things coming up and I'll be first in line for all of that. Um, all, the, all of the films that uh, came out, Tyresha Poe with uh, Scylla and the Spades. It's gonna be a Amazon series. I'm a huge fan of that movie. I'm, a, I'm really curious to see what she does with it in the TV mm. space and also what she does next. Mm -hmm. um, Misha Green. Um, I'm really, you know, she just signed on for Tomb Raider. We, we know about Lovecraft Country. Uh, she's one of the smartest people that I've ever met. I mean, she's really, really brilliant. And it, all of that comes through in her writing. And I love that she's also directing in a major, major way now. Um, yeah, I have my eye definitely on all of them and more. <laughs> you know, curious to see, you know, what Jordan does next in the director's chair. And there's just like so many people coming now. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm just, I just want more. I want more, more, more yeah. films. How, how does it feel to be in this era of like almost a, a, a revolution of, of just black creatives and being able to be at the forefront and, you know, you see like Donald Glover and Issa Rae and all these people just getting amazing projects and being able to do pretty much what they want, movies, act, direct. Mm -hmm. And like, I just feel like it's just like a new era for us to, to be able to create and tell our stories. Yeah, I mean, it feels correct. It feels correct. And at the same time, I want more. I, I want it to move faster. I want more people getting through. Um, yeah, I just, I want that aperture to open up. <laughs> and because I know there are more people creating, more people with really great scripts that need to get produced, that need to get out there. And sometimes I think the pipeline is still moving too slow for me. Mm. Uh, but it feels good to be in the pipeline. <laughs> and every, every, Everyone who is in the pipeline, for the most part, it's because they have 
been really proactive about their careers and getting something made on their own, you know, no matter how small it was. Even when I think about like Justin, Simeon and Dear White People, oh, how yeah. he got the concept piece first. I don't know if you all remember that, but before his feature, he shot a couple of scenes or, or like a scene and mm -hmm. edited together with oh, some wow. and um and and it kind of had a viral moment and from there he got his money to go make the film and it was mm. still very indie and very you know uh lo-fi um they they always needed more money but he was able to make those moves because he did that first thing and yeah and that's what I'm seeing with everyone who's out there now is, is for the most part is the indie spirit is very, very alive for us as black creators. Yeah. I loved, I recently saw bad hair and I'm pretty sure that Dante had it on his, his movie club. Yeah. I showed that, that as was well. Insanely good. It, it, <laughs> so crazy. A lot of practical <laughs> special effects. Like I love practical special effects. If you're going to do scary stuff, I need to feel like it's in the room. Yeah. And it, it, it seems like Justin had a really good understanding of that, that like, you know, practical effects really do make a difference in the way that yeah. things look. I like film. that too. And I laughed a lot on that movie. <laughs> yes. I, I writing that line between, I like when a horror movie is funny, you yeah. know, yeah. and um, I seek that out. And so I, I see what, what he was doing there and he definitely succeeded in that. I was cracking up, uh, but I also got those jump scares in there. So yeah, it, it reminded me of um, like uh, Vampire in Brooklyn comes to mind, but also that uh, that 90s, late 80s, 90s movie with uh, Kadeem Hardison with the succubus. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, what is that called? Hold isn't on. Isn't that a vampire movie too? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, with Angela Bassett? Yeah. Mm. No, that was Vampire Movie. Yeah. I just saw that recently. It was I was so going to say that, that's what came to mind. Um, it's Death by Temptation. Have you ever I seen that movie? Seen that one. Do seen yourself that a favor and watch Death by <laughs> Temptation. It is a movie about a succubus, uh, and Kadeem Hardison is in it. It's. A crazy... It sounds erotic in nature, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Samuel Jackson's in it, too. Um, oh, it... oh, 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 wait. Right. Let me write this down, because I'm going to watch this this weekend. Yes. Death by Temptation. All right. You got it. And it has Samuel Jackson, rest in peace, Bill Nunn, and wow. Kadeem Hardis. It's a... It's a... I see Kadeem was really trying to do something with those. <laughs> those whole <horror laughs> genre. He had a moment where he was just like, I want to do dark shit for yeah, a couple like, years. Right. Like, I'm going to twist it up. I'm more than you think I am, you know? <laughs> so, that's cool. Yeah. Go um, I heard you, well, one, you created a house for all of your, your, your work and projects, right? And then I also heard you kind of doing something that's, ancillary to it that's not really connected like you want to do like a hotel or something with it a whole what a hotel oh my hotel house of numa yes <laughs> so yeah house of numa is my production company but it's really the curations of everything i love and art and film and culture mm. you know and so I've always dreamed of having a hotel, but having that hotel encompass all of those things. So there'll oh, be wow. a theater, there'll be a library. Wow. And I that's also really want cool. to be a, a space that's also like for artists and residents can also be um, live in that house for different periods of time, but be an active hotel. It's, it's a very large concept, but everything that I'm doing uh, today is building towards that. So yeah, House of Numa. It's a, it's, wow. it's a real house. Gotcha. Yeah, to see that. Yeah, it's, it's it's really dope. So um, you know, as we wind down, we have some like basic questions we want to ask. We try to ask all of our guests. Um, give us three of your favorite movies. Just three of them. I know you probably have fifty million, but three <laughs> that come to mind as we talk. Three movies that kind of that kind of rep. Off the top of my head, uh -huh. um, I'm thinking about Truman Show. Oh, I um, love Truman Show. I'm thinking about Eve's Bayou. Oh. And, and I'm thinking about Blackula. And I think that's 
So like it was so good. That's the that's the three films that I love that I've seen more than once. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Uh, to something... me, that's the measure. If I've seen, if I'm willing and excited about watching the film more than once or twice, yeah, it goes into the favorites jar. So, nice. gotcha, gotcha. Um, do you have uh, like a favorite memento from a project that you've worked on? Uh, you mean like a quote or something, or a... uh, like an actual, like either like a shirt or a prop or anything like that? Have you kept anything that's that's cool or not yet? Yes, but I feel like I can't say because I wasn't supposed to take that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it was Oprah's. You took Oprah's Bible <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on the on the set. <laughs> I'm just laughing. Yeah. Were you a? <laughs> There might have been a missing prop on a, a project I work I worked okay. on that now belongs to this now yeah. house with me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's good enough. We can leave it that cool. Yeah. <laughs> did, oh, yeah, did you ever meet Oprah? I guess that's the question. Did you ever meet Oprah when you did? I have not met Oprah. I've been in the same room with her at the Essence Luncheon. And like right when I was trying to get someone to introduce us, here comes our bodyguard. She's going to go eat lunch now. Oh, oh, oh. It was done. Um, yeah. But I will. I yeah, will. absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good. She's going to hug you. You going to hug her? So. I feel like Oprah gives great hugs. I feel like yeah. you're going to have an embrace. <laughs> She definitely uh, does. I would love to direct her in something where she <laughs> could be all sexy again, like the butler. Oh, that would be so dope yeah. if you got it. I think she's so incredibly sexy. She's underrated in so much. Yeah, you're right. She she's very attractive. And I feel like I feel like people don't hit on that enough, how beautiful she is. You know what's yeah. another person that doesn't get that due? Whoopi. Whoopi. Whoopi is she is very so pretty. I, I, she has like this glow to her. Yes. She's a light. She's a light. a light. She's a light. She's, She's out. out. Like a like light. A light. <laughs> <laughs> um. So do you do you like sneakers? Are you a sneaker person? I'm not a sneaker head. Um, okay. But I like you know I want those Balenciaga sneakers. <laughs> but I'm so comfortable about sneakers. Like I'm like a, a very like hyper feminine in that way. I, I like sexy boots and strappy heels and <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. If when I when I do wear a sneaker, it'll be something like um like a Chuck, you know. Yeah. I love Chucks. I'm a sneakerhead, but I have a couple pairs of Chucks that I just like a plain white one, you know, yeah. like clean. Just, yeah, I'm not a sneakerhead. Gotcha. Um, yeah, we can talk about you know boots and and heels. <laughs> What's your favorite pair of boots? Yeah, well, you you have like a boot pair of boots that you like. This yeah. is the go-to. This is the boot. Or if if you're going out with your significant other, you like this pair of boots I'm wearing, and they go go crazy. Well, as as you know, in Jezebel, that there is a famous pair of boots. Yes. Uh, own you know i like the like nice thigh high boot okay. oh yeah okay yeah. okay dope 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 um so we also have this um segment called the branded 10 so we're not gonna put you on the spot right now no Are i we? am i'm gonna okay. see how many she can do uh -oh. <laughs> all right go ahead go ahead Dante. so the branded 10 is a curated playlist by you uh basically you give us 10 songs that are either important to you or tell the story of you uh so you don't have to give all 10 if you can't but we want to at least get a couple that okay, resonate with you <laughs> all right so we're going to i make a lot of playlists uh, for different projects they're all telling some stories i'm gonna pull the one my toxic playlist um okay ready yes <laughs> so <clears throat> number one on the list is I Thought About Killing You by Kanye West. Oh, oh wow. That is toxic. I like it. Have keep it listened? going. Keep it going. Yes, I wanna... of course. Okay. Number two is Phone <clears throat> Down, Erica Badu. Love that song. Uh number three is Drove You Crazy, Gucci Mane, featuring Brian Bryson. Wow. <clears throat> Uh, number four, Lust by Kendrick Lamar. Oh, love Lust. Number five, 
Tell Me by Jesse Boykins. Jesse Boykins is so underrated as a singer. Tell okay. Me. I love it. Yeah. Um, number six, So Gone, Jill Scott. Mm. Number seven, All Your Secrets by Gwen Bunn. Can we talk about Gwen Bunn? Please. I yes. love yes, Gwen Bunn. Gwen Bunn is a black and sexy alum. We didn't even talk about all the early music. Yeah. Like, no, we didn't. And um, uh, gosh, now why am I blinking on her name? Uh, Isley. Uh, uh, oh, what is her first name? Alex I Isley. Ah. Alex um, Isley. Yes, She's Alex an amazing Isley. singer. All like early day black and sexy alum um, love their music. So Gwen Bunn is part of that group. So All Your Secrets, Nobody Else by Summer Walker. What number are we on? A lot of chat. Yeah, I think we're at seven or eight. Dirty by Tank. It's a vibe, two chains. <laughs> 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 and the last one is Earthquake by Tyler, the creator. I love Earthquake. I love it too. His live performance, I think it was at the Grammys. It was amazing. Well, I, I, I watch it. I love that song, yeah. I watch it. Uh, yeah, he's a talented dude. So that's I'm a playlist that I write to. And that definitely tells part of the toxic story. <laughs> Starting with, I thought about killing you. <laughs> well, now we can't wait to see that project. Yes. You can put the music to the, the, yeah, the visuals. Yeah, listen to all those songs and you'll catch the vibe of uh, <laughs> what I'm about to put out there. So we can't thank you enough for oh. your time, your, you know, your, your candidness, um, your beauty. Um, we, the, we lighting. Really the, the lighting. lighting. The light. The, light. <laughs> the light that's just coming off of you. Um, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, you told us about your upcoming projects. You pretty much said it all. Do you have any advice, any closing advice to creatives um, who, who want to tell their story, who want to put something out tangible? Because you have a lot of tangible stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you go from the process of dreaming it to to making it tangible you have any advice for that i mean if you haven't done anything yet mm -hmm. um to not be worried about how small it will be at the start you know just do that small thing you know even if it's on your phone grab whoever you can just do something that's three minutes like mm -hmm. it just that will build your confidence to the next one. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of people feel stuck with that first move because they're looking at people that have a volume of work, but that volume of work started with the, the first thing, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's okay to be wrong and it's okay to fail on your own thing. And it's, it's okay if you're gonna look back and, and be able to see your growth, that's okay. Please start the thing. Uh, please begin because we need more of our voices. And I really, really try to encourage people. And I know sometimes that advice, like, well, just do it, just seems so kind of trite and not specific, but it, it's really that simple, yeah. you know, to just begin to start. If you two hadn't started this podcast, you know, you would like, still be talking about it or right. dreaming about it or whatever. And the fact that you're doing it, it's building on to the next thing, you know, so... Um, I want to thank both of you for your light. I can tell mm -hmm. that you're best friends and, you know, this conversation has just been a good one, a really good one. It's fed me. Uh, thank you. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Thank um, you so much. So uh, as far as people following you and checking out your work, where can we visit to do that, that for the people that aren't familiar? Houseofnuma.com. Um, my early work is there. The script for Jezebel is there. Upcoming projects are there. And on social, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Miss Numa. So, and as you know, I'm rather responsive <laughs> on my social channels. <laughs> we appreciate that. Thank uh, you. And, uh, so, yeah, I encourage people, you know, to reach out, say, hey, what's up? Let me know about your projects, stuff like that. Cool. Oh. All right. Well, cool. Thank you. Thank you for um, your time. Go Ronald, ahead. Go where, you. I'm sorry. Where can, no, I was going to say, Ronald, where can they find you? 
Me? Uh, oh, they could catch me on uh, who is Ron James. Um, I post a lot of stuff. It's a, it's a lot of blend of stuff. I'll post like clips of stand up, clips of shorts that I've been in, um, the clothing line. Um, I'm, I'm wearing a oh. In Love and Memory of Radio Raheem t shirt. Oh, no. uh, I have a, a small clothing sort of situation on Etsy called T Jam. That's doing really well in in the in the wake of COVID and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to the Etsy store. Okay, I'll send you. I'll I'm send going. you the link. I am going. I'll, yeah. I'll send you the link. You'll find some. Did some, you stand up online? Yeah, I'm actually doing stand up after this uh, thing, but we'll be there. We'll, we'll be, be there. there. So um, oh, look at the brotherly love. <laughs> so in Baltimore, like, uh, so you know, there's a there's a community. There's uh, Pierre Benu and a couple other people and I, we kind of stick together and do shows together. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do. Please let me know about the next one. I can't come tonight. Okay. I owe my, yeah. I owe my kid a movie night, but I do want to come. I love stand up. So, oh, oh, cool. Um, cool. Yeah, so let, please let me know about that. Absolutely. So who is, who is Ron James on all social media? Um, Dante, where can they find you? Uh, Kation Smooth on all the platforms. So C O T T E O N Smooth. Um, I am a designer, so you'll see all my visual stuff that I do. So I am in like the footwear and apparel industry. So you'll see a lot of concepts in, on my pages about that. My Twitter is just my random thoughts. So if you want to <laughs> see what I want to talk about for my day to day, I put stuff there. Um, I think I created like a, a link in bio thing for like my, my portfolio of the work that I've done. If you want to see that, um, obviously we do the podcast. So branded podcast on all platforms, B R N D D podcast and my movie club, DCO movie club. Um, I forget which one we're showing tonight, but we did American skin and, and uh, one night in Miami this week already. So we, we got some good stuff coming up. Um, and you guys check that out. We'll continue to follow the podcast. We'll definitely put some more stuff out. Um, and appreciate you, Numa. Thank you. Thank you, Numa. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. 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 Thank you